Good morning, and welcome to the inaugural Environmental Justice and Healthcare Summit, grounded in justice, rooted in wellness. Inaugural, that means it's a first, y'all. That's exciting. It is my pleasure to, and honor to welcome each of you to this trailblazing event by the North Carolina Black Alliance. And kudos to the organizers and planners of this event. I am Shauna Singletary Williams, President of the Board of Trustees of the historic Warren County Community Center in downtown Warrington. Warren County might ring a bell to you as it is the birthplace of the environmental justice movement 40 years ago. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't recognize her as someone in the environmental justice or healthcare circles, you are correct, I am not. But I am here to tell you a story, because that's what reporters do. This story is about my journey from New York to North Carolina and the intersection of events and people involving the 1978 PCB dumping, the 1982 protest marches in Warrington, and more. To this day, parts of this story even make me go, wow. As a God-fearing woman, all I can tell you is divine intervention. So let's start at the beginning. I was born and raised in Harlem, New York, until my parents and I moved to a small suburb of New York City called Pleasantville. We were the second black family in Pleasantville after the late actor Sidney Poitier and his family. Now, I could tell you all about my experiences as a black girl growing up in white town, but that's not why we're here. But my decision to head south after 17 years of life in the north is one reason I am here today. I went to Duke University, majored in education, thinking I was gonna be an elementary school teacher just like my mom. But words from my father the night before I left for college stayed with me. Think about a career in broadcasting because you're a good public speaker. The cliff note version of this story is that I started in broadcasting the summer after my freshman year. 18 years old, I started working at a local radio station broadcast to the city of Durham. After graduating from Duke, I attended Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and got a Master of Science degree in journalism. Then I headed back to North Carolina for my first job at WTVD, Channel 11. Over the next six years, I was a reporter, weather anchor, and news anchor. In 1982, I went to work for NBC Network News based in Miami as a correspondent, an on-air reporter. I stayed with NBC News for 25 years, continued working as a freelance producer for another 13 years. I am now happy to report I am retired. Along this journey of life, I was married, widowed, and married again now to a man from Warren County, Yarborough Williams. Together we have five children, 10 grandchildren, and one great-granddaughter. In 2008, after using the community center as a headquarters for the election of Barack Obama, my husband and I were asked to join the board of trustees of the community center and bring some friends with us. Ten years ago, I became the board's president. We have been working hard to restore the building, have programs that make the center relevant to the community and known to young people. Now, I think to understand how and why Warren County became the birthplace of the environmental justice movement, it may be helpful to hear about the Warren County Community Center. It was born out of need. But let's go back a bit further. After the Civil War, Black people made many civil rights gains during Reconstruction, which ended in 1877. The Jim Crow state and local laws enforced segregation in the South. The 1896 landmark Plessy v. Ferguson ruling by the United States Supreme Court confirmed segregation as long as the facilities were separate but equal. Well, therein, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> is the rub. Separate was not equal. Surely not in the 1930s in this small rural county of Warren. Schools lacked books and supplies. Black people could not use the library. 
And in downtown Warrington, there were no restrooms for colored people, whites only. Okay, let me say that again so it'll sink in. If you traveled to downtown Warrington for business, banking, shopping, even to go behind the back of a restaurant to get food, if you needed to relieve yourself, there were no restrooms for people of color. Basic human and civil rights of African Americans were being violated and not met. The Warren County Negro Community Center and Library came into being to right a wrong, injustice against African Americans. School teacher Winnie B. Williams is said to have been 80 years old in 1933, the oldest living and still working as a school teacher in Warren County at the time. Mrs. Williams had the idea for a reading room for teachers when they visited Warrington. In other words, she meant a restroom with lavatory facilities. She galvanized the whole community. According to our records, 100 postcards were sent out and on December 25th, 1933, yes, I do mean Christmas Day, 96 persons, men and women, met at the John R. Hawkins School. The group unanimously accepted the principles involved in the proposition and began at once to set up the necessary machinery. That included a 15-person board of trustees with 12 colored men and three white men. Donations, government money, soil, blood, sweat, and tears led to the construction of a two-story state-of-the-art brick building in downtown Warrington in 1936. The community center became a focal point for black life in the county. Meetings, parties, weddings, 4-H, home extension, scouting events, socials, and of course, bathrooms, and even showers. It was not only the place, it was the only place for black folks to go back in the day. What's important about the creation of the Warren County Community Center with Winnie B. Williams at the forefront is her observation of a need her insistence there was a problem and her solution for it. A woman in the 1930s, she was smart, well-educated, determined, had tenacity, courage, strength, and resilience. We honestly cannot imagine what black folk back then endured to survive and get ahead. Racism was alive and well. Blacks were not accepted in most places. In fact, it was best if we kept to ourselves and to our own. Ms. Williams left some valuable life lessons that I believe helped the people who some 40 years later were faced with a life or death obstacle, also facing racism and other trials. In 1978, the Ward Transformer Company of Raleigh Rather than follow the EPA regulations for disposing of polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, between June and August, some 31,000 gallons of PCB contaminated oil were illegally, under the cover of night, sprayed along 240 miles of highway shoulders in 14 North Carolina counties. Warren was one of them. Once discovered, that actually ended up being 60,000 tons of PCB-contaminated soil that needed to go somewhere. Well, my first trip to Warren County was in 1978 for WTVD to cover the illegal dumping of the PCBs. Now, it's been 40 years ago, folks, so I have to ask you to cut me some slack because people always ask, what did you do that back in 78? Exactly who I saw, who I interviewed, what my story showed, it's a mystery to me. But I remember we drove from Durham to Warrington every night, Monday through Friday, to cover the story and raced back to Durham to WTVD studio to lead the 11 o'clock newscast with this story for a whole week. 
And believe me, it was a big story. My friend and colleague, whose name you might remember, Beverly Burke, can tell you what clothes I wore that week, but I don't remember. And I've tried to find footage or a transcript, but no, no luck so far. But it is my understanding from talking to folks who live here, it wasn't long after the illegal discharge of the PCB-laced oil that residents took note that something was off, something was wrong. My husband said there was a shiny spill up and down the roads and on the grass. Also, according to Wikipedia, the midnight PCB dumpings, the state erected large warning signs along the roadsides, making the public feel as if the roadside PCBs posed an imminent public health threat. Well, that's certainly an understatement. Remember, 1978 is also when New York State officials discovered leakage of toxic chemicals from underground into basements of homes in the Love Canal neighborhood of Niagara Falls. I don't need to go into details about what happened here in North Carolina over the next four years. It was decided that the PCB contaminated soil should remain in Warren County along with the soil from the 13 other counties. Well, that didn't sit well with residents. And remember, it was dumped in 14 counties and there were EPA sites equipped to handle toxic waste. Shortly after the illegally sprayed oil was discovered, people started meeting to figure out what to do. There were meetings on the federal, state, and local level. Folks here mobilized, strategized, and planned their actions. The meetings across Warren County were in churches, homes, with the county commissioners. A notable public hearing drew several hundred people and lasted many hours until 2.40 in the morning. People even went to Raleigh, met with Governor Jim Hunt, legislators, lawyers, scientists, and others, and numerous lawsuits were filed to stop the dump. But by the fall of 1982, it was known that Warren County residents did not want to host a permanent site for the PCB contaminated soil. It was believed and known that a site here was an ill-conceived plan, a criminal act on the part of the state, an industrial disaster for the county, and a threat to the health of the citizens. I was not here in 1982. I'd gone to Miami to work for NBC. But I know people who were here. When you go to the North Carolina Black Alliance website and click on our commitments, then environmental just, justice, there's a video in pause mode of showing two young girls on a road in Warren County. The 13-year-old on the right wearing a white top, mouth, mouth wide open, is our daughter, Concerto Williams. Hmm, things that make you go, hmm, wow, how does that happen? Concerto's father and I got married 22 years ago, but it was just last year that she sent me an article about Warren County's remarkable resistance movement with her picture as a protester front and center. A few months after she sent the article, I was on the phone with a UNC archivist who was working on an exhibit that just opened July 25th at the Wilson Library at UNC, Chapel Hill. And it was about the 40th anniversary of the birth of the environmental justice movement. And that, that will be up until December. In that first conversation, the archivist mentioned he and the photographer working on the project were trying to find two girls in a photo. Yep, the same photo that I've just talked to you about. Concerto was one of the hundreds of people who protested and got arrested over those six weeks from mid-September to October in 1982. She was active with the youth of our church, Coley Springs Missionary Baptist Church, and she could not understand how someone could dump this nasty carcinogenic stuff illegally on our roadways and then think they could get away with it. She was mad indignant and she was passionate about it and felt the need and, the, to, and felt led to march. 
She was not alone. Residents were frightened. They were angry, concerned, and determined. Not in my backyard. They were worried about contamination of the air, the water, and even future economic development. People here were likely underestimated. We had no political representation on the state or federal level at that time. Warren County was considered politically impotent, made up of mostly black people, and a poor community. In fact, at the time, statistics showed we had the highest percentage of black residents in the whole state and nearly the lowest per capita income. What the state and the nation came to learn and see in the six weeks of protests was a unique multiracial intergenerational coalition, a David versus Goliath, if you will. The people like our daughter who came to march were young, old, black, white, indigenous people. The resistance that led to the birth of the environmental justice movement had some Winnie B. Williams in there too. The movement was born out of a need. It was fueled by tenacity, courage, strength, determination, and resilience. Organizational and rallying meetings were held at the Coley Springs Missionary Baptist Church, some two miles away from the proposed dump site. Backed by God and faith, they pulled from the Civil Rights Playbook even consulted with civil rights leaders, and many came to march side by side. You've heard their names. Reverend Leon White, field director of the United Church of Christ, Commission on Racial Justice. Reverend Ben Chavis, Dr. Joseph Lowry, president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. U.S. Representative Walter Fontroy, Golden Franks, Floyd McKissick, chair of the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. The protesters were told to be nonviolent, and they were. But who expected that when those trucks, 10,000 of them in all, started rolling down the road to start leaving the contaminated soil, that demonstrators would lay their bodies down on the ground to block their path? The Coley Springs pastor, Reverend Luther Brown, once commented, the fear was the thing that drew people out, especially fear of the water being poisoned. Adults and children were arrested, children as young as four years old. Behind the scenes were more people who were babysitters of the children whose parents wanted to march, cooks making food and providing beverages for the protesters, artists who made the signs to be carried, and others putting up bail money for those who got arrested to get out of jail. I understand from one of the protesters who was arrested that first day that women went home to make fried chicken and biscuits. So when those arrested had not gotten released and it was getting late, the women would find men with strong arms to throw the chicken and the biscuits over the fence into the waiting hands of the hungry being detained at the Warren County Jail. This was a people-powered movement. In closing, I am saddened to tell you that to our knowledge, there has never been a complete, comprehensive, documented study of the health effects of people in the community since the dumping. That, too, is criminal. We know for a fact that the dump failed. Chemicals got into the air, got into the water, and likely into any animals in the area who drank the water and so into people's food as well. Anecdotally, we know of one couple who marched in protest admitting we are scared for our health. Nine years later, both of them died from cancer. A principal at the local elementary school in the same community as the church and the dump site remembers two children who got cancer. One of them was in kindergarten, only five years old when he died. In our house, Concerto's birth mother died of breast cancer at the young age of 36, leaving her, two younger siblings, and my husband. 
I have no doubt there are countless others who were sickened and died because of the reckless behavior of the company that brought the contamination to our community and to the state leaders who refused to send it to a site that was built to hold and store such materials safely because the state said it was too expensive. How do you put a price tag on a community's health, a person's health? Thank God for people like Ben Chavis and Dolly Burwell who made the connection early on and called out environmental racism in Warrington. Warren County may have lost the battle, but we birthed a movement. We have gone from being victims to being victors. What man meant for our harm, God has turned into good. We all know that racism has played out in community after community across this country when it comes to our basic civil, human, and environmental rights, placement of hazardous waste sites, our health care, and so much more. In Warren County, we are realizing now our power in telling our stories. And we look to the Akan tribe in Ghana, their Sankofa bird, the mythical bird has its feet firmly plant, planted forward with its head turned backward. We are not forgetting our history in Warren County, but we are moving forward stronger and better than before. I applaud each of you for your role in environmental and healthcare causes. As you know, you have your work cut out for you. The sheer number of contaminants in this country is mind boggling. That in 2022, so much of what is decided in this country is still based on race is disturbing. But we must keep up the fight so we can really turn environmental injustice to environmental justice for all. I thank you for your time and attention I'm happy to answer any questions.